To Jacob Rabinow, it's creativity that drives invention, a process that he considers an art form with little or nothing to do with logic. The really breakthroughs are, are unexpected. They come out from random combinations of things that nobody ever combined before. And this means that it is very much like writing a poem, composing a piece of music, or doing anything else which is new, different, and unexpected. By the way, it could be unexpected to the inventor as much as it could be unexpected and surprising to society. His artful engineering has yielded 229 patents, covering a diverse range of technology. In weaponry, safety fuses for rocket bombs. In the home, a novel turntable design. On the road, magnetic clutches and self-regulating clocks. In the post office, automatic letter sorters. In banking, check reading machines. In photography, innovative enlargers. And in computers, the world's first magnetic disk memory. Jack, as he is known to friends, regards all of these as personal statements. What drives a person to play tournament tennis? What drives a person to lower his golf score or solve a chess match? It's a thing that you're good at and you, you'd like to be better at it. It's a, I guess the right way to say it, it's an ego trip. It's a way of testing yourself. For Rabinow, the testing began in an extraordinary childhood he describes as too eventful. Born Jacob Rabinovich in 1910, he and his family lived in European Russia and Siberia for his first nine years. Fleeing the revolution, they moved to China, where more calamity awaited. Typhus claimed his father's life. His mother emigrated to America with Jack and his brother David and opened up a modest corset shop in Brooklyn. They were so poor for the first two years that they lived in an apartment with no hot water, no bathtub, and no toilet. With this humble background, Jack was led to believe that he had no apparent future when he emerged from New York's City College in the 1930s. I was told that the Jewish engineer is a contra contradiction of terms, that you cannot get a job in, in, in engineering with a degree, but I thought since the Depression was on at the time, I'm going to starve anyway, and I decided I'd rather starve as an engineer than starve as anything else. He went to work for the government in what was then called the Bureau of Standards, where he spent most of his career, with a very successful detour in the 50s and 60s at his own firm, Ravenel Engineering. There, he refused to do defense work and feared that the inflated prices would make him careless. And he set up a flat management structure that was considered radical at the time. I had everybody in one large room, including my own office in the front, so that all the people could watch me and come in and drop in and talk to me and I could watch everybody work because I didn't believe that one should have many layers of authority. Rabinow believes invention can be taught, provided the process begins in early childhood. When I watched great tennis players play, I noticed a lot of them play two-handed. That is, they, they learned tennis when they were too little to hold the racket with one hand. And I think that what we need is to teach people the science and mathematics also when they're very young. And what we need really is two-handed mathematicians, two-handed scientists, two-handed invent inventors. He suggests an upside-down approach to creativity. That is, doing the opposite of the norm. Or the 606 method, meaning that there may be 605 attempts before the real solution comes to light. Rabinow believes that people can start inventing at any age, as long as the environment is right. The culture has to love the subject and be interested in it, and they really have to be willing to support the kind of teachers that teach it. For example, the Italians love opera. They get great opera singers, and they get, and they get good opera. Uh, the Europeans love to play soccer. They have great soccer players. South America has great soccer players. We love basketball. We have great basketball players. If we loved science as much as we love basketball, we'd have some very much greater Maybe I should say taller inventors, not only two-handed, but seven-foot inventors.